So welcome to our special guest, Howard Greenwood. Um, welcome, Howard. Yeah. Now, Howard is the co-founder and one of the directors of Love Work Life. And I'm going to let Howard tell you a little bit more about that and his background before we dive into today's topic of conversation, which is around retained business and introducing retained service into a recruitment business. And we've got a really good um, meaty conversation to have with some great questions. And as Howard and I have just been having a quick chat, um, there's, um, this is going to be really valuable if you are a recruitment business who have been thinking about, do you add in a retained service? How can you develop the retained service that you've, you've introduced some time ago, but maybe not really developed? Um, here is a gentleman who has got a lot of experience of taking a business and completely flipping it in terms of the balance of contingency to retain. I'll let Howard, te Howard tell you a little bit more about that. So Howard, should we, should we start by just getting you to introduce yourself and just say a little bit more about your, your, your long background in the recruitment business? Thanks for that introduction. A long background, yes. <laughs> it's a long background indeed. It's uh, 25 years plus since I entered the recruitment market. And I, I always say when I entered the recruitment market, there wasn't a computer on my desk. It was a Rolodex, a pen and a paper. The fax then came in. It was such a, a joyous thing. And now look at where we are now today. <laughs> so I've a lot of change. But like most people, I sort of fell into recruitment. I did my time on the desks. I was a contract consultant with Lorien and I worked very hard for nearly 10 years for Lorien and got an opportunity to uh, move up to computer people and start to manage. And that's where my sort of real love of managing the process and managing the recruitment process really came from. And uh, I was, I think my manager described me at the time was, if it's not shiny Greenwood, we're gonna stick you in there and you can make it shine. And I developed a very strong sort of process of how to develop businesses and how to develop offices to make them more collaborative, make them more productive. And I took in that stage some of the worst performing offices in, in, in the CP brand, the computer people brand, to some of the best performing offices uh, in the, in the whole, whole ADECO brand in the UK. Um, I got an opportunity then to be promoted into to be a director. Uh, and I then was directing uh, the London and Southwest divisions of, of computer people, then took over with computer people and spring across the UK, the north of England, Ireland, etc. Mm. Uh, so a lot of experience on that in the big corporate world. I stepped out of the corporate world and went to work with some uh, mid-sized agencies. I worked as a director for uh, Evolution. I worked as a director for Robert Half, who were a very large financial organization, but were looking to bring a technology business in, so helped to develop uh, part of their technology division. And then I started freelancing. I did some freelance work uh, for 18 months for an ex-employee of mine who'd uh, gone out and started their own business and got pregnant. Happy she was lucky to get happy, lucky she was a, you know, worked very hard to get pregnant. I think it's the best way to describe it. She, you know, did everything she could to get pregnant and fell pregnant with twins, which was absolutely good and was absolutely delighted for her. You know, yeah. and not really any different to that. And um, she wanted someone to come and run, run a business and help her run a business. So I spent 18 months with her on a contract, running a business, developing a business and putting strategy mm -hmm. grow. Um, and then we became an MD of my own business and was running a business that was basically took over a business that was in a lot of turmoil need a lot of infrastructure work putting in, a lot of process putting in, and actually put all that process into that, uh, into that business, including what we're going to talk about, putting a retained strategy mm. in. Um, and then I met my business partner, Paul. He was the head of Office Angels whilst at the Deco. Uh, Paul has got, you know, as you can say, he's got 40 years plus of uh, recruitment experience, so yeah, a little bit older than myself. Um, but we both have the same style of, uh, management and the stale, same style of leadership is that it's not about us, it's about the people, it's about investing our time in the people. And what we love to see is, uh, this is the why we get into the business, is we love to see people achieve their goals, we love to see people sort of reach their limits and then go beyond their limits and how we drive beyond that limits. And that's where Love Work Life really sort of uh, champions. So we're very different to most mentors and coaches. We are very invested in our people, we, we love to see our people achieve things. 
Uh, and that's how we build our business from there. We, we were very different to a normal NED, and we always say that you know, a normal NED will come in, drink coffee in your board meeting, take notes, and then come back a month later. We want to be very invested in that business and drive that business, and we're very pleased about the way that we work with our clients and the way that we invest in our clients. And I think one of the best ways of describing it, I had a client, one of my first clients, uh, and I've been doing the consultancy work on and off for quite a number of years before working with Paul and doing it officially. Uh, one of my first clients for the comment was we've been on a lot of courses, a lot of uh, different recruitment, in, inverted commas, gurus. You guys seem to have been in there, you've done it, you've seen it, you've been the big business, you've been the cold faces, small businesses. Mm-hmm. You're usually the MD, the T-boy, the accounts person, the admin person, the marketeer. You understand every part of our businesses. What they're very good at telling us is the other companies are very good at telling us things that we already knew. Mm-hmm. What they tell us what we didn't know, yeah. that we were really interested in. And this guy said after four months, he said, it's really strange. He said, I challenge you. And I was a bit sort of like, are these guys going to do this? They said, after four months, we've built more in the four months that you've been working with us than we have in the eight months previously. And you've opened up a whole different recruitment world to us that we didn't even know existed with regards to management and how we work from the cradle to grave of the recruitment process from a business view than I've ever seen before. He said it was really refreshing. And, you know, we keep working with all these clients and, and, and uh, from that basis. Yeah. And we're very honest that we will say to clients that we don't want to sign you up on long-term contracts. We want to sign you up on a month-rolling contract because we believe every time we come into your office, we need to be earning our money. We need to deliver quality and value to you. Yeah. So we work in, in that manner to, with all our clients on a, a month rolling, we come in and work on a month rolling. And that's how we are. And we're very proud of the clients that we work with and their achievements. And it's their achievements. And that's what we yeah. want them to achieve. We want them to achieve the love work life that they want and then can move away from there. So that's you know, a checkered history of my background. Yeah. And why we're good with and I think, you know, in terms of how you and I met, um, it was probably this time last year, actually, um, mm-hmm. you know, as chair of um, APSCO Yorkshire. And, and I heard you do a talk around today's subject of retained. Um, and it's really interesting, I think, because I think over the last 12 months, you know, working with our client base, um, you know, going out to, you know, a whole variety of different kinds of events, I just seem to be having more conversations with people who have got retained on their mind. So they're exploring it, they've dabbled in it, they're thinking, you know, we need to do more, um, but having the time within the business to to develop that that service. Um, So just kind of like, you know, as we start to think then about, you know, retained, the retained business model within recruitment, you know, from from your experience of working with it, you know, taking a business through, through the change um, process. What, what do you see as some of the pros and cons of that retained model for a business in today's recruitment market? It was a very interesting sort of first question. What were the pros and cons? And I remember sort of receiving your questions the, the day before yesterday. I started scribbling copious notes. And anyone who knows me knows I scribble and write copious notes constantly. I, I like to refresh myself. I like to go back to certain points mm. and, and work on things. And you're right in what you're saying. There's a lot of companies out there that have got retained on their mind, but mm. fear their ability to get retained. And I always say, look at the pros of retained. You know, you look at that, you're getting a client on an exclusive basis, you're getting higher fees, you're getting part payment for your work, you're getting actually paid for your work before yeah. you're reading your work from there. Mm. You almost then create a formulaic process rather than just you've got a contingency process, you create another process that comes on top of that that can be repeated constantly, and it's how you sell that process. And this is where we'll, we'll get to, I think, in the joint mm. is how they fear the sale of that process. But then you start to think about the candidate generation that goes on as a pro. The candidate generation goes on is far different to the candidate generation that goes on with normal contingency recruitment. And the residual value of those candidates is huge. And yet a lot of contingency recruiters use uh, their their, their candidate generation process, put the candidates through the recruitment process, and they never really switch base to those candidates again. If you're a true retained person, the cost of the candidates that you get through that retained process are a genuine fee that you can use, and it's how you do that. So the residual value of your 
output is huge. It's not just one fee, it's one, two, three, possibly three fees yeah. out of that and even more. You also engender massive amounts of candidate loyalty. And in this marketplace, candidate loyalty is a huge, huge economic value to your business. Mm -hmm. And if you do retain properly, you will generate a true candidate loyalty because candidates understand that you're not fishing. You're not just out there casting a net and hoping yeah. you, they, they land a fish that they can place in the juicy role. They know that you're working. And I think sometimes just simply saying that you are a recruitment partner, you are headhunting on behalf of this business. And I challenge any recruitment company out there to go onto a client, uh, sorry, go onto a candidate and say, I'm a recruiter, I'm looking for this type of process, uh, look at this type of person, et cetera, et cetera. And look at the response they get from the candidate. And then go onto a candidate and say, I've been engaged by a client to headhunt you as a person. And look at the difference in the response that you get. Yeah. Because you claim that you are now a headhunter. You're doing the same process virtually as you do as a contingency recruiter. But because you're now headhunting a person, all the, almost immediately, the engagement from the candidate becomes huge because they feel, whoa, somebody's headhunting me. Someone actually wants me. Yeah, and there's that little bit of spark. So yeah. it's not just about that there. So that prestige is really important. And then you start to flip onto the con sites. There's lots of pros, but the con sites are very few, really. I think the con about pressure, and it's how you deal with that. And I go into lots of companies that have started taking retainers, and they say retained on everything, and yet then they can't deliver. So there's a pressure of delivery. So we'll talk about later on this, in this uh, mm. webinar with regards to the pressure on delivery and why that pressure is so important. So what you actually take on retained is really important. How you take on retained is really important. Mm. There's a lack of trust from clients when you start to talk about retained. And that lack of trust comes from the way you pitch to the client because you can pitch a contingency model and then you expect them to pay a retained fee. Mm. And they have that leap of faith that I'm going to actually step across the, 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 the bridge and actually pay a third, a half up front, whatever it's going to be. And that to a lot of clients is a bit of a leap of faith, considering the last 30 years, we've been doing it for free. Yeah, yeah. A minute. Mm. The housing market hasn't been doing it for free for the last 30, 40, 50 years. They've been charging people 30, 40, 50% for their services and taking a third, 50% up front. So clients do know about this. It's how you sell it that. So the lack of trust from clients is always there. But that is down to the lack of either track record or how you're delivering it back to the client. Mm. So the fact that you can't differentiate between your product becomes a real con. And you've got to be able to differentiate your product. And the final thing that I always think that needs is a bit of a, a con when people look at that. They take their terms and conditions and they bastardize them a little bit to put contingency at one point and then put exclusivity and retained at another point. Mm -hmm. However, the terms and conditions usually aren't concrete enough if ever they were challenged to go to court. So it's how do you make the terms and conditions actually work for you that differentiate yourself from the normal contingency right. recruiters. So there's a huge upside. And mm -hmm. once you get the upside of recruitment going, and I've seen this for myself that, you know, consultants average fee of, let's say, 5K on a board. A consultant goes up and chucks 6K on the board and the office is going, yay, 6K, 6K. And consultants are going, no, that's a third of the fee. That's just the retained part. And you can hear that sort of deathly quiet as people go, that's a third of the fee. And so the upside is if you start to get that manifesting through your business constantly, and all of a sudden people see them placing large deals on board, then other consultants want a part of that. Part of that, yeah. And it's driving that. So the pros and cons are, you know, almost immaterial, okay? It is all a pro if you get it right, and it's yeah. driving to get that service right, and that is all about the belief system. Yeah. Life. What are people and, and I think, you know, you've, you've mentioned that, you know, Retain has been around for years and years and years. And, you know, it, it is interesting that, um, you know, you you commented that you've noticed it, that, you know, building and introducing a retained service into a contingency business, you know, is on more and more people's minds. And 
you know, I, I think that's coming from a place of, you know, the market's just, you know, expanded so much in recent years, there's so much more competition, so people are thinking, you know, how do we stand out, how do we stay ahead of our competition, you know, do you think that there's, there's an element of trend around, you know, this retained thing, or, um, you know, or is it something that actually, you know, it, it's, it's, it's just a continuation and perhaps it's just getting retained back onto business owners radars um, in a, perhaps in a way that it hasn't been sort of post recession. If we go back the last 10 years or maybe retained dropped off a little bit. I think there's, there's a couple of ways of answering that. Is it a trend? No, it's not a trend. Yeah. Okay, as I've said, it's, it's been around for a long time Absolutely, in yeah. business. You know, mm. Headham are proud to Headham and they're proud to charge high fees for their hosting services. Okay, um, I think it's out of necessity. The market is changing, and um, I was at an house meeting uh, just before Christmas, and I think the stat, and don't quote me on the stat exactly, but the stat was something around that, that 30% of every placement that was made in the UK last year was made by an RPO. By the way, wow. That's a lot of low-hanging fruit that's disappeared out of the SME marketplace. Mm. Let's start to put on top of that the in-house recruitment model. So all of a sudden, the marketplace that was 10 years ago, 15 years ago, where you created your own agency, you would have a number of clients where you gleaned their low-hanging fruit and you made a great living out of that and then you expanded, expanded, expanded. Mm. It worked. Well, that low-hanging fruit is now getting smaller and smaller because the RPOs are picking that up and then, obviously, the in-house businesses are also picking that up. Mm -hmm. So the market's changing from being sort of quite a generalist market there where lots of the, the major clients now will go still use agencies, but they want to use agencies on a very niche level. They want to use them on a specialised level. So my view is if you're using agencies on a specialised level, then you should be paying for that agency. You should be paying for the service that you're going out to. After all, all these big clients pay for all their other services. Why are we a free service until we only make a placement? Absolutely, yeah. There's the necessity that it should change. And if you think about what's happening in the recruitment market, if you don't change with the marketplace in the next five years, then you could be facing a very, very difficult time. So you have to start adding tools to your recruitment kit. And one of the big tools that people want to add to is a retained service. And I'm absolutely 100% behind that because everyone should have a retained service. And it's how you do that. So if you're going to specialize and become more niche, then having a retained service is really important because what you're talking about is really owning the candidate marketplace. And if you can own the candidate marketplace and you have the product that people want to buy, then they should be purchasing that product up front. They shouldn't be waiting for you to be in competition with three or four other people. And it's like rocking up to an airport and saying, I want to fly to Spain. Okay, right. Jet 2, EasyJet, BA, etc. You've all got flights going out today. Who's going to offer the cheapest price? Yeah. You wouldn't do that. No, no. But people expect recruiters to do that. So we have to change the mindset of our clients and we have to change the mindset of our candidates and the mindset of our consultants in our businesses to really make that leap. Now, the head to market has been doing that for you know, forever and a, and a day. There is no difference to what we do to what they do, other than they get paid up front for what they do. Yeah. Their service is better. Let's be honest about that. Yes. They yeah. need to be better, okay? But there's no difference really in what they do with regards to a recruitment functionality. Mm -hmm. So is it a trend? No, it is necessity. And I think the wise business owners need to make that change and need to add that into their recruitment portfolio but then it's how you add it and what you get from that so so i guess that leads us quite naturally then on to this next conversation so let's say you know um there's a drive from a necessity point of view um you know things are continuing to evolve in the market as you say so what what do you think are some of the key things then that a business needs to consider if they are wanting to introduce a retained service, let's say at the minute they're a hundred percent contingency and they, they are looking to introduce a retained service. What's the starting point for them? I think the starting point has to be, I always talk about the three C's of recruitment, clients, candidates, and consultants. Mm. It has to start with consultants. 
the consultants have to have the buy-in to what's actually happening, to what's going on. They have to have the belief that they can sell retainers and they have to understand what is involved in selling that retainer. And if you've got the buy-in from the consultants, then it becomes momentum. So you might have the buy-in from 10, 15, 20% of your consultants. Once other consultants start to say, as I've alluded to them, performing, then it becomes infectious. Why am I talking up a three grand deal on the board here and getting really excited? He's just chalked up a seven grand retainer, and that's 30% of the deal. Whoa, what am I doing? You know, so it becomes infectious, and people start to see that, and they start to see why that's happening. So the first thing that I always start with is you must start with your, 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 your consultant. You must get their buying. They must believe that they can sell that, which leads to the second part, that you then need to provide training. And you need to sort of have a strategy. And I always talk about, uh, you know, if you look at a business, a business will have some sort of mission statement. And from that mission statement will become the strategy and the tactics. So as part of your strategy and tactics is retainer, you've got to think about your pricing strategy and your actually delivery strategy. You can't sell contingency and ask for a chain fee because a client's going to look at you and say, hang on a minute, a week ago, you do that for free, now you're asking me to do it for more. So you need to train your consultants on how to pitch, and they need to be pitching in every single time they speak to a client about a role, the retained service. So as all the other companies, you know, I'll keep using a CRM provider. A CRM provider will ring you up and say, for the vanilla version, you get this, and this will cost you X. Yeah. The vanilla version, plus this, this, and this, you'll get that, and we'll charge you why. Why is always more? But what they do is they start with their basic sell and start with the vanilla version, so you understand the vanilla version. So they need to pitch the contingency business constantly and then say, however, if you want this as well, this is our retained version, this is what you be, and you can get two fees. So therefore, you separate that. So there needs to be some training and development done from all clients on the difference between contingency and retain, and then training your consultants to sell that every time they pitch a client. And that's the key. Every time, there's no point differentiating and saying, I'll only pitch on that one over there, not that one over there. Mm. Because consultants then will never pitch it because they're not used to pitching. It has to become part of their recruitment DNA. It has yeah. to be part of their sell. The other thing that we talked about early on in this as part of the cons was the terms and conditions not being fit for purpose. And what I mean by that is that a lot of people will just say, well, you've engaged my services for recruitment, that's 33%, you've been CV production, 33%, finished product, 33%. And if they don't get the finished product, a lot of clients, because of that lack of trust, will push back and say, I want my retained money back. And if they took that to a court of law and I've put lots of terms in front of lots of solicitors, they'll say, well, because you haven't provided a, a product, this looks like all that's linked together, then you owe them the money back. And they end up paying the retainer back, which then has the knock-on effect in the business that, oh, if I'm going to do that, I have to give the money back. What's the point of doing it? Mm. You have to make each individual part divisible, so on its own. You are engaging me purely for my recruitment services, nothing else. You are engaging me purely for CV delivery, nothing else. You're engaging me for delivery of a person into your desk, nothing else. And make it very strict from there. The client also needs to understand that. And I also think that so when you sell to a client, you need to make it clear why it is a retained service and what's going on, which goes back to your training on the pitch from there. We then talk about candidate generation and the difference between a headhunter and a recruiter, okay? And it's the level of service that they provide to the candidates and to the client. It's the mm -hmm. fact that they know their product so well. You know, every recruiter goes and says, well, I interview all my candidates face-to-face. -face. No, they interview them over the phone in the general. You know, look at what happens when you get headhunted. You get a researcher come on the phone. I'm a researcher for the key headhunter in the business. I've been identified you as a key prospect, blah, 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 et cetera. You get excited. And you get through that researcher. Then the headhunter calls you and talks to you about the job and reconfirms the job. Then they come and meet you. 
So mm-hmm. all the level of service has massively creeped up. Okay. Mm-hmm. And people, you know, well, hang on a minute, that's really expensive. Well, it is expensive. But if you're charging a higher fee for that, it should be expensive. You should get a far better level of service. Absolutely, yeah. Mm-hmm. It means when you provide your shortlist to your clients, your shortlist is far more dynamic. So when the client sat there and he's having to choose between two or three candidates that are brilliant, rather than I've got four candidates, three interviews are absolutely atrocious, yeah. and one's okay, oh, I'll take the okay one. No wonder you're getting your fees dragged down so much. So your actual performance and how you perform through the recruitment process has to increase, and your level of service has to be a real high-touch point service. So you need to differentiate that retained service from a contingency service. And as I say, you need to sell that. Mm-hmm. The other side is that a lot of business owners expect this transition to happen overnight. It doesn't happen overnight. You yeah. have to leave of your consultants. You have to consider the leap of faith from your clients. You have to consider the amount of time it takes to get that cell perfected and into the business. And that's where I, I, I specialize in perfecting that cell. Mm-hmm. So it's not going to happen overnight. There has to be a transition period where it swings. But it all starts with making sure that every time the consultant pitches for a job, they pitch contingency and retain services at the same time. Mm. But I work really hard on that. Um, the next thing that I sort of start to think about is what do we do differently is that, you know, what do the headhunters do? As I said, they don't do the 360 model. And the 360 model in recruitment, if you look at the attrition in recruitment, if you, sub, if you tell me a company that says, oh, 360 model works, I'll go, show me your attrition rate. And they'll go, oh, well, I took six people on in the last quarter. So far, I've got rid of two. One's on the runway to go. One's not performing. I might get two out of that. So the attrition is really high in that first three to six months of that model. However, you know, if you develop that model where you've got a researcher just dealing with candidates, you've got a resource of dealing with jobs and dealing with the client and you've got a salesperson out selling, all of a sudden it's a different marketplace. Again, people think about the cost of that. Okay, that's three people now dealing with a placement. However, if this research, resource, research sorry, is bringing in candidates constantly, there's a massive value in those candidates that should be placed. So you're going to increase your number of placements. Yeah. If you a salesperson selling the product and a resourcer that actually servicing the product to the client. Therefore, the client's getting two or three people involved in that service. All of a sudden, your stickiness in that client increases. Yeah. Also, your risk is if your major 360 villa walks out the door and you don't know their clients, the clients aren't walking out the door with them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You your risk. But yeah. you're massively increasing your level of service. You become a genuine high touch point service. Now you can have a blended approach and a mix and a mash of those type of people. But that is, you know, what the high end headhunters do, mm. and they charge a lot of money for that, and they get paid a lot of money for that. So I think sometimes that belief system is get the candidates and the consultants believing in what you're doing, then the clients will come along, move away from the 360 model. Put a process in place that actually works and then deliver it in that in that manner. And I think there's lots of things that you can do when you start moving from contingency to retain. It's not just selling with contingency and then trying to put a label on it and say, now pay me for that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No client yeah. ever going to buy that. So it's a really different sort of type of viewpoint. Yeah. And there has to be some proper planning in place. And I always say, you know, proper planning prevents poor performance type scenario. Yeah. You know, you the lumbo that goes on with that. But in this case, it is genuinely true. If you put yeah. the money in place and you prepare properly, then you will get performance out of it at the end. Yeah. And that performance isn't just about that one big deal. It's about a lot of big deals. And it yeah. massively changes your business hugely. Yeah. Now, you've used a word um, a number of times, and I just want to um, explore it a little bit more. Because you've, you've mentioned that, you know, it's the importance of getting um, consultants to believe mm. in what they're selling, okay? Mm-hmm. And uh, the difference between contingency and, and retained, which kind of like, uh, I know I've heard you talk a little bit more and you and I have spoken about this ourselves, um, the importance of 
mindset in this, um, I, I guess, cell. Because it's that they're sending a, it, there has to be a different service. That's what I'm hearing from you. Um, and it, it needs selling differently. So do you want to say a little bit more about what you've experienced in, from a mindset point of view? Because I know you feel that's, that's it's a real key piece in this whole yeah. conversation, isn't it? So I always do, I do, yeah, whenever I work with companies and whether when I was working with my own teams and my own businesses, one of the first things I always did, I do a training session on mindset and working on the belief systems. And I tend to do that on lots of companies that I go into and try and challenge people on their mindsets. And I think mindset is very interesting. The mind is the most powerful muscle, if you want to call it, in the body. And it can make you do lots and lots of different things. And um, I always believe that there are two people inside you, okay? There's the good, perfect you, and there is the imperfect you. And these two people are battling constantly on that. And what I mean by that, and this is, you know, I'm, I'm a prime example of that, and I'm a prime example of how this works. So last night I came home, uh, I'd gone to the gym, and I uh, got in, answered your email first, sort of getting undressed and thought, Still look a bit porky, really. You know, should really do something like that. Tell you what, tomorrow morning, I'm going to get up at six o'clock. I'm going to go for a run at six o'clock in the morning. I'll be nice and fresh then when I've got this meeting here. So I'll be nice and fresh for this meeting. The alarm went at six o'clock. So the perfect me at 12 o'clock last night was up for a run at six o'clock this morning and absolutely wants to do it. The imperfect me at six o'clock went snooze. <laughs> I'll get out of bed, snooze, okay? Because that's how people work. Now, that's my mindset. That's my belief system. Mm -hmm. And I also believe that when people start to think that they can't, what they do is they build pillars around them that lock them in of the reasons why they can't. Everything they look at says, oh, I can't do that. That proves I can't do that. I can't do that. I can't prove that. However, the per people that believe they can do it have the same belief system. They build pillars around them that demonstrates I can do that. I can do that. That demonstrates I can do that. So it's having the, I suppose, having the gumption that you have got these two people inside you and the imperfect person is building pillars around you saying you can't do that and the perfect person is building pillars around you. So who's going to win? So you've got to shut one up and make one dominant. And if you make the perfect person inside you more dominant than the imperfect person, then you will always start to achieve more. And it's about having that positive language going on inside your head of, I can, I will, I will do this, rather than that imperfect language is I can't do this. And one thing I always say to you, anyone who listens to my, my, my sessions and stuff like that, I'll always go back, any consultant that walks into any meeting with me and says, oh, I'll try to do that, I want to lean over the desk and grab them by the throat and shake them and say, we try, instantly by work, using the word try, you've instantly said that you're not going to deliver. Because you okay. came to me in a month's time and said, well, I tried to do that, and it just didn't happen. And these are the reasons why. Yeah. Because you've already built that belief system in your head that you're going to try to do it rather than that you're committing to do something. Yeah. So I work a lot on the belief system and getting people to understand the difference between the two people inside them that are talking like constantly and yeah. how you can control those people and how you can then build on that. And it's not just about the individuals, it's about the managers, it's about the owners of the business having the belief that they can actually change their business and do that. So it comes all the way down the line and then bounces at the bottom and all the way back up the line. And if you create a belief system of, we can do this, we can achieve this, then if you think about anybody else coming into that business, that belief system becomes infectious and they start to believe that they can do that and they join in. And you look at any... Um, Let's take, and I, I, I don't like the analogy bits of so the right one at this stage. Look at Man United and the, the Ferguson years. They believed they could win. And they believed they could do it all the way through. And Ferguson ran that all the way through the team, bounced off the bottom and all the way back. As soon as someone didn't believe that, he got rid of them straight away. Mm. The whole team, support and everything, was so in awe of Ferguson that when he left, they believed they would never be able to replace him. And look what's happened since then. Yeah. Yeah. And that is all about the belief systems that anybody walking into Man United has still got this massive cloud of Alex Ferguson over them, believing I've got to be as good as him. I can't be as good as him. 
mm. rather than thinking, actually, I've got to be as good as myself, and myself, and drive them. So a lot of the belief system is about looking at other people and going, I'll never be good as that person, therefore I won't try. Or I'll try, but I know I'm going to fail because I can never be good as that person. Yeah. But I always look at it and say, there's always people above you who are better than you. There's always people that are people who are below you. So if you try and reach that person that's above you, you're never going to be there because all you're going to think about is I'm failing, I'm failing, I'm failing. Mm. If you always think about the person below you and think, I can beat that person below me, you'll always beat them. And therefore, you'll have that false sense of winning. So the person you've got to be is yourself. And you've got to really control yourself properly through that. So it's a real change in mindset of, and I, again, I'll, I'll, I'll use another thing that I work on quite a lot in training is that black box thinking. If things go wrong, what people tend to do is they look at the crash site and go, right, it's gone wrong here. This is where we haven't made enough retainers this month here. And they're looking at the number of retainers they go, and I'm going, hang on a minute, that's the crash site. If this was an aviation crash, an air crash, they go inside the plane, they find the black box, they open the black box and they go, right, the crash actually started way back here because it hasn't crashed at the end of the month because we haven't got retainers. It's crashed at the start of the month because we were pitching to clients. We weren't pitching retainers. We didn't sell it with conviction. I've listened to all those calls. So there needs to be some training on this part here. And yeah. so you've got to start thinking about black box thinking. It shouldn't be a blame culture. It should be a culture of collaboration, a culture where people feel free to say, I'm failing, help me, why am I failing? Let's open up the little black box, look inside it, right, this is what's going on, let's do that. Rather than looking at the end of the month, you've not hit your figures, why haven't you hit your figures? Mm. You've not hit your figures, and the instant result is you haven't been on the phone enough. It's nothing to do with that, it's to do the process and what's going on in the process. Yeah. And again, it's all about that belief system, creating a, a, an atmosphere of collaboration, a free speech type atmosphere where you can really go, where they feel that, they feel that their thoughts count. They feel that what they do counts towards the business. Mm. And that means if they feel that their input counts the business, then their belief system goes up. They're adding value to the business. Where a lot of managers and owners push people down because of the pressure of, you know, I've got to return an investment off this person. I'm not getting a return an investment from them, so I'm going to put a lot of pressure on them to get that. And that pressure has the reverse effect and yeah. makes that imperfect person go, I told you, I told you, I told you. Yeah. And the perfect person is now sat there going, I can do this, I can do this, but that noise is getting lot smaller and smaller yeah. and smaller. And the imperfect person in mind puts a hammer on top of them and says, ha, ah, I've got you. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes when they get into such a rut, don't they? It's very difficult for them to sort of climb back out of that. Sure, yeah. You know, and I think, you know, you've... As you were talking there, you know, you, you mentioned as well about, you know, this, this thread, you know, coming all the way, you know, through the business from the top all the way down, you know, to, to the teams, which, which just kind of make me wonder, you know, when I, when I think about some of the conversations I've had with different business owners uh, around this, you know, introducing contingency, there are different um, ways that business owners are going about, you know, um, resourcing and introducing this, this new service. I mean, what do you think is, um, you know, is, is there an ideal way to do this, you know, or are there different options, um, you know, in terms of, you know, do you just introduce it and train everybody in the business, you know, or can it be a case of, you know, start with a team, get, get it embedded there, and then, as you say, the, you know, that the infection of, of the res results can spread. Is there a right or wrong way of, of introducing a resource in this service? So, yeah, it's a really interesting question. And when I got the question through, I, I read the question and I was thinking, okay, that's a, a, a good way of looking at it. And it's a way that I thought, how do I view this? And I thought very simply, you know, recruitment is full of people on a daily basis in every recruitment agency trying to reinvent the wheel. They constantly try and reinvent the wheel. And how many consultants I see fight against the system and say, if you follow this process, you will be successful. And they fight against that process and they're never successful. And so I think if you're going to introduce retained services, then take a leaf out of the headhunters book. Look at what the headhunters actually truly do. 
and think about, right, why do I have to reinvent the wheel when someone's already got the wheel working? I just got to look at how that wheel actually works and then implement that wheel into my business. Mm -hmm. So if you go into a headhunter's operation and you look at what they do, they are absolutely CRM first. Their CRM is a hive of money to them because they spoke to so many candidates, they treated those candidates in such a perfect way that when you speak and pick up the phone to that candidate, that candidate will engage with you. Right. That candidate, if they don't engage with you, they'll probably give you someone else to engage with. So CRM first is really important. Headhunting then becomes an art. It's the art of actually capturing the minds and hearts of the candidates so they actually come to you constantly when they need something. Whether they're coming to you as a candidate or whether they're coming to you as a client, they'll constantly come to you. Right. So, as I alluded to when we talked about you know, going from contingency to retained, you know, mm -hmm. do you have to change your model to a, from a 360 model to here are researchers, here are resources, here are salespeople, or here's a blend. Could you have a researcher? Could you have someone doing the resourcing and the, the, the selling at the same time, et cetera, et cetera, and how that works? It could be that you may have four or five people who are selling and two or three who are doing the researching. So they're flooding you with candidates constantly all the way through that. So the candidate generation becomes the real key to the difference. So you could have lots of AI, you've got lots of, you know, your I intro, source breaker, et cetera, all these type of tools that you can use, but it doesn't get away from the human element. And the human element is always going to be the priority element when it comes to headhunting, because what the client is going to do when that candidate gets on site, they're going to find out how much bang have I got for my book. So have I got a candidate that is absolutely brilliant? Yeah. If they have the skill set and the behavioral set and they are brilliant, the next thing they're going to try to discover from the candidate is what was the recruitment service actually like? What did I pay for? What did I actually get? And if you haven't got a brilliant service, then you say, well, that's no different to what a contingency recruiter does. Yeah. You know, if they suddenly realize, I had a phone call with this person, I had a military pre-screen call with this person, I met with this person, they met before the interview, they gave me all this information, they did this, they did this, they did this, et cetera, et cetera. All of a sudden it goes, ah, I now see what I paid for. Yeah. Also, the candidate that's actually being presented is better than what normally comes through contingency recruitment. Mm -hmm. And the quality of service that they've provided has been absolutely hugely different. Yeah. So there has to be a blended approach when we start to resource for these of getting the process right. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We can put what's already in process in place and then you know, tailor that to each individual business and then add the appropriate AI to that that will help generate candidates or increase your service to your client that differentiates you from your market competitors and that's the thing, as the market shrinks, how you differentiate yourself is really important. So yeah. thinking of new ways to resource and new ways to uh, you know, bring retained business in, to me is a bit of a strange thing because it's already here. Okay? Yes, we can improve on what we've got, but trying to sort of reinvent the wheel is just a bit of a strange situation. So the wheel is already running. It's whether you're running on that wheel or not. And if you're not running on that wheel, then... It's how do you get onto that wheel? How do you make that wheel run for you in a perfect way? And what do you do? Yeah. That to me is a sort of the way that I'd be looking at it from there, that, that it needs to be a blended approach of higher touch point human interaction and AI to help uh, expedite the resourcing power and the client's perception of your service. Yeah. And I, and I think, you know, actually you've in different parts of our conversation so far you, you probably answered the, the next question that's on on my mind in terms of if a business owner i've had people say this that um that they're not they're choosing right now not to pursue um a, a retained model because that they, they have um you know they're, they're not sure if they've got the right talent in the business to sell retain because it is a different uh, product it's a different sell but I guess, you know, when you think about what you've shared with us so far about, you know, belief around mindset, around the training, but then also around, you know, the model, the 360 model versus the 180 model and the different examples that you've given us, it might even be more than 180. Um, 
that, that actually what, what I'm hearing you say is that, okay, that there will be, you know, a significant piece of change for the business to introduce and lead and manage, uh, resulting in probably maybe you know, shifting the model and the roles that you have in the business away from 360. Um, but getting those roles in place, training people, making sure people have got the belief and they've got the right mindset, that, that actually um, it, it is more than achievable. You know, not having or believing you haven't got the right talent shouldn't be a blocker because actually you, you need to look at the talent that you've got. You need to look at your model. You need to consider people's mindset and you need to train. So, I mean, would you agree with that? Because I'm just kind of like sort of trying to put all the pieces together um, to answer that question for myself. You know, what do you think? I think, you know, in this, you know, competitive marketplace, there is no harm in upskilling your staff. There is no harm in improving their service to both candidate and client. Because if you improve the service to the candidate and client, you'll improve the longevity of your consultant within your business. Mm. You'll improve the return on investment for yourself as the, as, 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 as the, as the custodian of the business. Yeah. So there's nothing wrong with training and keeping on developing your staff, where a lot of agencies go through that first three, six months of, heavy training and putting that training place in, uh, in place and then very seldom do any more training after that they expect mm -hmm. just to learn as, as, as their own job okay. and I think that there needs to be an improvement of recruitment skills all around and if you look across the whole marketplace from you know if you go away and speak to clients and this is what a lot of agencies have they, they fear to do, they fear to generally have an open conversation with a client about the recruitment marketplace because they're fr afraid of being labeled as, you know, you're the car salesman, you're the estate agent, et cetera. Mm. And there are lots, of, a, a true story this weekend, I was camping in the Yorkshire Dales and uh, in a pub, I bumped into two different people whilst queuing for a drink. Both did the same job. First guy sort of chokes us up, oh, you know, what are you doing? So I'm camping, etc. What do you do for a living? Ah, oh, I'm a car salesman. And he said, oh, I'm a car salesman. And he was quite proud about being a car salesman. So, okay. Yeah, chat away, but off he, off he went his way. A couple of hours later at the bar again, and uh, another guy's there. And I said, oh, you know, chatting away. He asked me what I did. I said, what I did. And he asked me what I, I said, I said, what he did. I said, I sell Ferraris. And there was a marked difference in the pride of he sells Ferraris. Now you go away and ask any recruiter what they do. Uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, uh, uh, I'm a recruiter. I'm just embarrassed to say the recruiter. Mm. You go find a headhunter what I do. I'm a headhunter. I'm a headhunter. Have you ever seen a film about recruiters? There's films about headhunters. It's not films about recruiters, you know? So the passion in what people do is very different. So upskilling people's skills and giving them the commitment and the pride in what they're doing says that they'll emanate that out throughout their life constantly. And so there's nothing wrong with a shift in skill set. There's nothing wrong with improving the skill set. And change is that horrible word that people say, we're going to go through some business change, and everyone goes, oh, my God, we're changing. Why are we changing? This isn't business change. This is business evolution. But the evolution happened 40, 50 years ago. It's just that this part of the business, or this part of the industry, is now only realizing that that's a really good evolution. I now should add that to my set. Yeah. And so it's all about that and how we can drive that. So improving the skill sets is really important. But to improve the skill sets, what we've got to improve is the high quality touch point that we engage with our candidates and our clients and keep that touch point really high. Mm. And that means when we're taking contingency work on, we take it on, we take four, five, six, seven, eight, ten jobs on. And we only ever service two. I think the national status for every 10 jobs that we take on, we place two. You look at the retained people, they're almost on, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. Their high touch point is huge. And people say, well, yeah, but they're one-on-one. -on -one. They're only making one placement a month. But they are making one placement a month. But it's a 30, 20, 40, 50K placement. Yeah. Making two placements at 6K and be really happy about that. You know, wow, there's a massive difference in that. Yeah. So, Having that change of that, and that to me is all about communication. Communication from the top down to the consultants and the consultants back up so they yeah. can communicate with that, is communicating that out to the marketplace and how the marketplace perceives you. 
And this is the big thing that I always say is that, you know, clients, you know, I'll go to cons- uh, agencies and they'll go, we're the best agency, this or the best agency in that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I'll say, right, give me five of your clients, I'll ring five of your clients. Let me look at the perception of what your clients think about you. Because your perception doesn't really count. It's what they think about you. Yeah. They are buying your business. Mm. If that perception isn't brilliant, then we need to change. We need to create something because it's their perception that is reality, not your perception. Yeah. And it's the same with consultants. Their perception of their performance may be different to what the reality is. So that communication part has to be absolutely huge. So when we talk about change, change is all about communicating the change and the positive reasons why we are changing, what that change is all about. So if you understand the rules of engagement when we start to change and why we're changing and what the period of time we're going to change over, then it means we understand what we're doing. It means that we understand that certain clients we will walk away from because that improves our service. Certain clients we want to work with because that improves our service. We need to train and upskill our own staff to really replicate what we want to achieve in the marketplace because the perception of recruitment from the marketplace is very different from our perception. And I'm sure you go speak to a lot of recruitment owners, they go, oh, we are brilliant at this, and brilliant at that, et cetera, et cetera. Sometimes you've got to take your head out of the clouds and go out yeah. to the marketplace and truly understand. Yeah. The That's a fearful thing for recruiters because it's that fear of rejection, that fear of being totally Absolutely. Which again, is all about mindset and dropping your mindset. Yeah. If someone told me that that is what their perception of my business is, instantly I'd say, right, let's look at the crash site. That's the crash site. Take the black box out. Let's go back and look at why that is. Let's change. Let's change. Yeah. yeah. That's absolutely. So it's not just about changing from being contingent to retain. It's about changing your levels of service all the way through. That's about communication, okay. mindset, and understanding the rules of engagement to get to where you want to be. And yeah. that's strategy and tactics come into place because then you have the rules of engagement within the business and everyone in the business knows what's going on. And it's communicating like down the business from there. I like that. That's a really, I like that way of thinking about it. Actually, just completely up leveling. Now you mentioned, um, you know, it, it's about evolution. It's not about change. You know, businesses are constantly evolving. Of course, technology is constantly evolving at a rapid pace as well. And you've, you've alluded to, um, you know, the role of AI um, with different products that are available. Um, you know, what's, what are your thoughts on the role of you know, AI and, and, and tech within um, you know, this en- en- enhanced service, shall we say, uh, an experience that clients and candidates can get? Okay, so let's, let's put cars on. So being a lover of tech, I was a tech recruiter. I was an IT recruiter and I love technology. Technology has massively revolutionized the world. It's changed the world already. Okay, but let's look at it from a recruitment perspective. Okay, so when I start, when we started this conversation, you know, early 90s, you know, Rolodex on my desk. All I've done is swap my Rolodex for a PC or a laptop. That's all I've done. Okay, so just somewhere to store my data has changed. That's all it is. So it's now in the cloud rather than on a piece of paper. Okay, so it's floating around out there somewhere on the cloud. Brilliant. Okay, rather than post the CVs, people email me CVs and I email them back out again. Okay, so that's just now an electronic version of the postman coming in and out. Yeah. Okay? How I find candidates though has changed. Before, I would put my contract ad in freelancing format, and that advert would be written on a Monday to go out on the Wednesday. Sorry, Thursday advert. So mm. Thursday. So I've got four days before my advert even gets out into the general press. I've then got three days until CVs come back to me, so I'm probably there back to the following one. This is seven days before I can start really servicing that. So it's speeded all of that up, okay? Yeah. But what it means is that I can got access to more candidates so quickly. Where I had to genuinely headhunt my candidates in the old days, I had to find a candidate, generate a lead off that candidate for another candidate, call that candidate, I had to find the number. Because I was trained in that method that, if a candidate's working at that client, find a method of getting hold of that client. They didn't have mobiles, so you were phoning their desk phones. Yeah. You were phoning their home phones. 
Okay, they've now got mobile, so we're out of text. And I always say, if you open up your, your mobile, I bet on the front page you'll have Facebook, so you can communicate to them through Facebook. You'll have Messenger, you can communicate through Messenger. You'll have WhatsApp, you can communicate through WhatsApp. And the list goes on of all LinkedIn, yeah. all the things that you can communicate through. So communication has changed from just being verbal mm. to actual AI and verbal. But it needs to be a blended approach. Any of those recruiters that think I can just do it by being a keyboard warrior, you're wrong. Any of those recruiters who think I should be the old school, I should be on the phone for 10 hours a day, blah, 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 you're wrong. There needs to be a genuine blended approach for both to do the right things. If your AI is really good at bringing candidates to you, brilliant. You've got candidates to you far quicker than before. If you could then find out where that candidate should be working. So you look at stuff like Sourcebreaker, that gives you all that type of information that before you had to do yourself. However, there's still the major part of recruitment is that humanization of the process, talking to your candidate, talking to your clients. Okay. And even I remember the, 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 the tech boom in the early 2000s, you know, and they were all there, you know, we could do this, you know, this is the death of the recruitment market. Well, that was 18, 19 years ago. The death of the recruitment market is either a very long lingering death or we're not dying. Yeah. I think I'm not dying. I'm just, te- yeah, my pulse is definitely beating. I'm not dying. So we've got to sort of embrace tech because tech is coming in and tech will change recruitment, okay? but you're not going to get away from that human interaction in there. So you, what you've got to do is you've got to find the right technology that adds benefit to your client and to your candidates. Now, whether that's you know how you bring the tech candidate to you, the process that you work with your candidate. So should you have an app that the candidate could log into so they can put all their details to an app? Should you have a portal that they could log into, that they could all go through, that you could have a client and a candidate logging onto that portal and then everyone could work through that portal and that portal has interaction parts of it, et cetera, et cetera. So it helps the candidate through the process. It helps the client through the process. Yeah. You know, there's lots of things that we could start to add and say we could add those things from a technology point of view, which then increases our level of service to our clients. Mm. Yeah. You know, we have an app for everything nowadays. There is absolutely there is an absolute app for everything. You know, my son's doing his driving lesson, and there's an app now that you pay five pounds for, and it will find you the quickest driving test that you can find. So all the actual uh, people that cancel the driving lesson, etc., they now come up on that app. And you pay five pounds for that app, and I'm saying, why don't you just ring up the driving centre and ask if you've got a cancellation? It's a lot cheaper. Oh, it's a lot quicker by the app, Dad. And we've got to start thinking that. And this is the big mind shift that I think that I talked about at another uh, conference late last year, is that technology is coming in. Unless we keep up with technology, we're going to lose very, very quickly. There's a digital revolution going on. I think I class it as a digital wave coming in. It's either kind of crash on the shore. So either you ride the wave or you sit on the shore and you get washed away. Yeah. You get washed away. Um, so... If you think, you know, let's look at the average age of people coming to the recruitment market at the moment, between 23 and 30. So they're all millennials or the next generation. Mm. Yeah? And how do they interact? They interact through video. We're doing a video here. Yeah? yeah. We could have written this. I could have written this, and we could have had a nice blog written out. But who's going to read that blog? Me at 50 odd, yeah, I'll read it because I like to read things. Okay. My son would look at it and go, what? Read that? You're going to laugh. It's on video. Yeah. He's just done his A levels. Okay. He hardly read a book. He's done everything through video. He passed his GCSEs. I said, What are you doing for English Lit Max? Oh, I've watched the film. 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 Have you not read the book? What do I want to read the book? It's William Shakespeare, it's boring, Dad. There's a film on there that shows me exactly what it is. Wow. And he got a B in his English lit. Mm. Yeah, but he never read the book. So the market's changing from being a paper-based market to a technology market. So how we interact with that market has to change as well. So we talked about portals, but we're doing a video here. We can use this product for a video interview. Why aren't we videoing interviews and sending that to the client? 
Okay, you might be videoing job specs and sending that to the client, the, the candidate, et cetera, et cetera. And so it goes on. So technology will come into our marketplace and how we use that technology will increase our touch point, it will increase our communication uh, yeah. marketplace. But it won't get away from knowing your product inside out, I have to meet my product. Now here, I'm not meeting you personally. I'm sat in Leeds and you're sat uh, somewhere up in the lakes, lovely, in the lovely lakes, okay? But we're not meeting it, Ethan. But because you can see my body language, you can see how I'm reacting. So if you can imagine with this as an interview, when I'm interviewing you, I can see it if you're engaged with what I'm saying to you. When on the phone, I might be thinking, are they engaged, are they not? I'm not too sure. But now I know whether you're engaged or not. So now I can now probe into you the questions I really want to ask because I know that you're potentially not engaged or you are engaged. So let me inflate that engagement even more to increase your desire and so i can use technology now so i don't have to spend two hours driving to where you are to interview you two hours back which is a very time consuming day okay i can do it by technology yeah and that's the difference and i think there's a lot of agencies that are still not grasping technology you yeah. know not grasping how to use social media to generate candidates and clients, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. It's going to be a fundamental change all the way through. Yeah. And selling retainers is just a part of that. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, leading, leading on to perhaps, um, you know, for, for me, a last question, I don't know if there's any things that, the additional things that you want to share, but, but something that, um, that does come up perhaps, you know, when, when recruitment companies and business owners are thinking about, you know, executive search and then their experience is contingency. One of the things that they, um, you know, will perhaps, you know, have in their mind is that, well, retained isn't going to work for us because, you know, our, the jobs that we work and our candidate base isn't at a senior executive level which is the perception, you know, and, and in, to some degree, the reality, let's say, of headhunters and exec search, that these are people who work director roles, senior roles, et cetera, et cetera. Do you know, what are your thoughts around, you know, suitable roles that work for the retained model? And does it differ to contingent? Too contingency, um, you know, or, or not, you know, is it reserved for more senior roles? Okay, so let's look at this in a very different way. So, the increasing number of companies that want to provide retained services that need to differentiate their service, and therefore, you know, where are you pitching your service at? Mm. Um, I always look at this in a very simple way is that you can't pitch a contingency service and a retained service, it has to be different, but the fundamentals are very, 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 very similar. Okay, and I always look at this and say, if you go up into McDonald's, you can buy McDonald's food and you get the same service everywhere you go. Hence why they're the biggest restaurant chain in the world. Mm. Okay, same service, same food, same product. However, it's a cheap commodity. It's a contingency commodity with you look at it recruitment. Mm. However, you walk into a Michelin star restaurant, you walk into a Michelin star restaurant and for the same beef burger, you're now paying... 30 quid rather than whatever it is in McDonald's. I've not been for McDonald's for quite a long time, so I've no idea what they're charging nowadays. Let's call it two quid, okay? And what's the difference? The process of making the burger is almost identical. The product is almost identical. It's the quality of the product and how that product is served to you. As you walk through the door and maitre d' meets you, they take you to the table, they explain the, the menu to you, they give you everything that, that you want, and they make the experience absolutely, undeniably enjoyable. Yeah. Okay? McDonald's, queuing at McDonald's is not an enjoyable experience. Yeah. That's what clients do on a contingency basis. They queue at McDonald's to wait for someone to give them a burger, okay? Rather than going to a headhunter, that will give them the Michelin star, five star treatment. Mm. But what you're talking about is which jobs to actually pitch a retain rap. Anybody can walk into a Michelin star restaurant and get the Michelin star treatment. Mm. Okay. Mm. So if you're training all your staff to pitch contingency and pitch retained, then you can almost go at any level. Yes, I would say anywhere, anything over 50K should be on a retainer. Anything local 
should be interviewing face to face. Any cancer local should be interviewing face to face to just to uplift your level of service, etc. What you've got to be very careful about though is not trying to take every single job on as routine. You have to be open and honest with your client. So you have to be honest enough to say, ask Mr. Client, I'm not going to take that retainer. I've already got 10 candidates that I know can do that job straight away. Let me just work with them straight away and I'll push that yeah. too. Yeah. You have to also then work on a retainer basis and say, look, Mr. Client, what you're looking for is going to take me an awful long time to find. You're looking for a very rare animal here. Mm. I'm not guaranteed that I can find that animal, hence why your terms and conditions need to be divisible. So if I take it on a retained basis, you're going to retain me to do the search and selection part. Okay, I will do the search and selection part. Once I've delivered that, then I will deliver uh, CVs. But I will give you an awful amount of communication on a very regular basis telling me you what I've done and where I am. Then we can then start to change and alter the recruitment process if required to get the right people. Yeah. Whether that's a 20 grand role or a 500 grand role. Okay, the process is exactly the same. But unless you're selling it constantly to your client, your client never knows the difference. And I'll go back to the CRM scenario. You know? When you look at buying a CRM, you get the vanilla version, you get this, this, and this, and this, and that will cost you X pounds. However, you get that plus this, 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 and this, and oh, that's really. that much more. Yeah. But you tend people, and when I speak to clients, they go, oh, my, my average fee is 25%, my normal fee is what I pitch in. Okay, and then when I pitch a retainer, I pitch a 20%. And I always go, why? Why are you doing that? You know, you'll say, here's my really poor service, and that's going to be 25%. Here's my super duper service, that's 20%. Wow. You know? Doesn't is... make sense, does it? And then the client's going to say, well, I don't want your super duper service at 20%. I don't want you that at 25%. I'll do it at 15%. And you go, oh, yeah, that's right, 15%. Drop my pants, contingency. 15%, you're now in with everybody else. Mm. And that goes back to the belief system of whether you believe whether you can sell the retainer or not. Yeah. There has to be a train, a train. There has to be a choice between contingency and retain when offering your services to your clients. And if you're doing that properly and pitching that in every single way, you give the client's choice of what they choose. Yeah. Mm. How good your salesperson is will depend on how much you get contingency and how much you get on retain. But if you give the client the choice, then they make the decision for you. Because it could be, let's look at it, I look at it from a tech point of view. Okay. And I always laugh at people say, oh, it's just first line support. And I'm going, it's not first line support. That's the first contact that a business has with your business. So if that first line support person is really, really poor, go back to ringing your bank up and you get someone that, you know, mm. doesn't really interest in speaking to you, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. You know, you're really annoyed by that because that's your first touch point with that bank. That's the, the impression you have of that bank. So the same first line support person. So it could be a simple, you know, recept someone to be working on reception. Okay. That's the first touch point. To me, that's a key hire. Absolutely. That should be service. Whether you're paying that person 20K or 500K, it makes no difference. Retaining to do that piece of work and I'll find you the best person, not the quickest person that's on the market. Absolutely. Yeah. And there's a big difference in that, that contingency means that you fish in the pool where mainly people are looking for a job. Headhunting, you go into the marketplace and you live in the passive marketplace and you try and generate candidates from that passive marketplace. Mm -hmm. That takes time. But the level of service that you give to that passive marketplace and the quality of the candidates that come out of that are far superior. Yeah. Why aren't clients waiting that little bit longer to get a far superior product? Yeah. You go to clients with higher on skills and fire on that behaviors. But if you spend your time working on that behavioral piece and to do that, you have to invest money and time to get the right behavioral set right. And yeah. all of a sudden you get a better quality of candidate to interview, which massively knocks on the cost of recruitment because you're not having to repeat that recruitment process as often because you're retaining that person longer. So where you pitch it is always a tricky one. Mm. But if you pitch it at everybody, then you haven't lost anything. You've only got an opportunity to pitch the retainer and get contingency. If you only pitch contingency, you're only going to get contingency. If you only pitch retain, you might get driven back to a contingency. If you pitch them both and give the client the option and you sell it properly, you can potentially upsell to the, con uh, to the retained service yeah. rather than having that option at all. Yeah. That, make, that makes sense. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, 
And just thinking as we maybe sort of start to bring things to a close, I, I am mindful, I just want to ask you, are there any areas that you think we haven't covered that you want to just, you know, say a few words about? Um, because I think, you know, you've shared some fantastic, really, really helpful insights with people that I know, I know loads of people listening are going to get a lot of value from this. So thank you. It's a pleasure. You know, it's a, have I missed anything? It's, it's been such a, you know, we've jumped around quite a lot and talked about a lot of different things. Um, I think from my point of view is, you know, talking to business owners and talking to consultants, mm. it's not, should I go retained? It's when I go retained. Right. It shouldn't be when I go retained. It's I'm going retained. What do I need to put into place? Mm. If you fear that change, then in three, four, five years time, it'd be too late. Okay. And this isn't even first mover advantage and trying to get a first mover advantage because a lot of people are already doing this. Mm. This is about doing the right thing for the business yeah. and increasing the profitability of your business. Mm. If you can suddenly say, actually, this month, 80% of my business is retained. I've already see, we see 33% of that service has been invoiced and billed. You know, all of a sudden it makes a whole difference. And if I look at, say, one of the companies that I took through over an 18-month period from a retained business, their average fee was 3.5K when I took over. Mm. When I finished, their average fee 18 months later was 10K. So a big jump. However, the retained average fee was 18K plus. So all of a sudden, not have I just elevated my business, I've elevated the revenue generation that's coming through my business. And what actually happens when you look at that is that people start to think, why am I working this 20, 25K role? I could be working a 40K role on yeah. the time. If I'm working this 40K role, I should be working a 50K. Why am I working 50K? Why am I working 100K? And all of a sudden, you've got 200, 300K salaries coming to you because you're working as now a headhunter. You go talk to normal headhunters, oh, everything's got to be 100K plus, 200K plus, 500K plus, okay? You look on their website, how many roles are at 50K? Lots of them, okay? So even the headhunters come down the value chain in their eyes to mm -hmm. get roles. Why aren't we going up the value chain? Why are we hamstringing ourselves to the contingency business at a low level? Mm. Think about what in-house and RPR are doing. They're hoovering up all that low-level work. So if you carry on in that low-level market, there'll be a time where there's not a great deal for you to go at. And there's so much competition. It's the 35 to 40,000 agencies in the country now. And there's about four to 5,000 new agencies every year. And about 3,000 agencies die every year. We are heading towards recession. There will be a telling off of, of, of agencies. However, those that can provide clients with a quality service and a service that differentiates you from everybody else will go through that recession on an upward curve. Yeah. So you've got to start changing now to do that. And I think that's the thing that I would say to all recruitment owners, it's not should I go, it's not when you go, it's I am going, but I need to get the right process in place. Yeah. And that's all about that belief system that I should be doing that. Yeah, fantastic. And that's what I do with clients, I, I, I do that for clients. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for your time, sharing all your experiences, um, some great stories there as well. Um, and if anybody wanted to get in touch with you, Howard, what just share with, with people your contact details? Okay, so my email address is howard at loveworklife.com. Our email address, sorry, our, our web address is www.loveworklifeconsulting.com. And if you want to contact me on the mobile, it's 07966. 251582. Or find me on LinkedIn, Howard Greenwood. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter. Find me on Twitter uh, from there and you can contact me through all those, those, those portals. Fantastic. Great talking to you and seeing you again, yeah. Howard. And yeah. hopefully we'll uh, get to have a beer pretty soon. Indeed. Look forward to it. Take Bye. care. Thank you. Bye.